Okay, so we're talking about doing what is right. We're talking about it not only caring for ourselves, but also thinking about others, how, how they are doing, and promoting what we consider valuable for society. For example, education and health. So we're talking more specifically about business, right? So we could be doing a course on ethics, but we're doing a course on business ethics. So we're going to, from the start, specifically talk about ethics in relation to business. So in business, we're going to be thinking about things like our career, ourselves, right? Our company, how our company does, and also social welfare. But the problem is, it would be a great world if everything was together. But they're not. They're in conflict sometimes. What's good for me might not be good for the company. What's good for the company might not be good for society or social welfare. We have these kind of conflicts. So what we are going to learn is a framework. This is a framework. Okay, the framework is not all the details, right? On this framework, I can put something and build something. Okay? So we're learning the framework. It's like some principles. Then when we have a specific situation, we can apply the principle to the specific situation and get the answer. Right? So we're learning like the base or it's called a framework in this class. So when we leave the class, we should have this framework which will help us to guide us when we have to make a specific decision later. So let's look at some different types Framework. So first one is a neoclassical framework. Neoclassical sounds like a big word, right? Uh, <coughs> I'll tell a little story which might help to explain where this thinking comes from. It's quite associated with capitalism. But when the uh, pilgrims first came to the United States, do you understand pilgrims? Pilgrims were the, the first people to go to the United States. Okay, in from the UK, let's say in the 17th or the 16th century or around the 17th century, right? So they landed in the United States, and these people were Protestant. Okay, they were very religious people. One of the reasons they decided to go to the United States was they wanted to make their own community, their own religion, where everybody was very religious and everybody was doing the right thing. Okay? Uh, away from England, where there were a lot of bad people doing bad things. Right? That was one of their reasons for going there. So they made their community, and the first year, they had the community. Uh, they decided they were going to share everything. For the social welfare, everybody was going to share everything. They were going to work together, make all of the houses together, make all of the food together, do the farming together, and at the end, share all the food, share all the houses. Does anybody know what happened to them at the end of the first year? Have you heard that story before? So anyway, some of them died at the end of the first year, right? They didn't have enough food for everybody. So the next year they said, I guess what happened was we didn't work hard enough. So let's work harder next year, then we'll have more food and nobody will die from hunger, okay, from starvation. So they did the same again next year, they shared everything. Everybody did all the work together. They came to the winter, there wasn't enough food for everybody. So again, the people were starving and some people died. Okay? So they said, 
maybe the problem is that people are not working hard because they know that they're going to get food anyway, whether they work or not, at the end of the year, <coughs> right? Because everybody is sharing all the food. So a lot of some people thought some people are not working hard. They're just resting, right? And they had an argument. Other people said no because they know that they can die. If they don't work hard, they can die too. So they, of course they're going to work hard. So they tried again one more year. But again, they didn't have enough food and the people died. So they gave in on sharing the food and they decided to try something different. That everybody has the private property and everybody just cares about themselves and nobody else. And this time you're not supposed to give the food to other people. Just you work for the food yourself and the food that you produce, you have. Just for yourself, not for anybody else. So what do you think? Did anybody die the next year? No, nobody died the next year. Okay, so this is where in the US we have capitalism. So you can understand the history of the US, right? From these first pilgrims who went to the US. And Adam Smith is one of the main authors who writes about capitalism. This is kind of, he wrote his book in the 19th century or 18th century. This is where these kind of ideas are based on or coming from, right? And this is one of the key ideas here, in this idea, is that if everybody looks after their own interest and thinks about themselves, in the end, it's better for society as a whole. Okay? Can you understand that idea or theory with this story? If everybody thinks about themselves and everybody has private property, right, which is protected by law, then they're going to work harder, and in the end, the society would be better off. Okay? Maybe they'll give some money to charity. So we can see that this is a very US way of thinking about things, right? Or capitalism. So this is also called a neoclassical idea. So uh, <coughs> we have people who have rational preferences between outcomes that can be identified and associated with values. Individuals maximize utility. So this is, utility means that each individual maximizes their own uh, output, okay? So they produce a lot of things individually, and then the firm can make more profit. <coughs> so, this is a narrow, quite narrow framework, but it has a big influence on management theory and practice, especially in the US, okay? It suggests that by maximizing profits for shareholders, we can do the best for ourselves and promote overall welfare. So if we look at companies, if we talked about that story in the US was with people. But uh, if we look at companies, if we apply this theory to companies, it means that if companies only think about making the profit for themselves, right? Then they are going to do the best for themselves, for their company, for their shareholders, and that this will promote overall welfare. Because if the company does very well, then it can create more jobs, right? The company can give money to the good cause, okay? So uh, they can donate money to the university, they can donate money to other good causes, right? But first they have to to want to maximize the profit first for themselves and get the benefit from this. So this idea, of course, can run into some problems. Can anybody see any problem with people just thinking about themselves or the companies just thinking about getting the profit, only about getting the profit? Can you see any problem with that idea? Don't protect, protect uh, 
weak. Weak, weak, weak person. Okay. Doesn't protect the weak people, right? Yes. Maybe the environment could have some problems if everybody's maximizing their own, trying to maximize their own profit and not worrying about the environment, right? So we have to look at other frameworks, right? But we should understand the idea of this framework because many companies use this kind of framework. Okay? And if you talk to if you talk to some entrepreneurs, right, who just focused on profits, they'll often talk about this idea. They'll say that, well, I made a very big profit, so with my profit that I made for working by myself, I can help other people later. Okay? If I want, I can give charity or that kind of thing. So the next framework is a, <coughs> the one we are going to look at, is a stakeholder oriented framework. So this is the one we'll be learning, right? So the neoclassical framework was more popular in the past, and nowadays, we are more concerned about this stakeholder-oriented framework. So, in business ethics, stakeholder is a very important word, so you need to understand exactly what this word means. Does anybody understand what stakeholder means? Can they tell me? We can see some stakeholders here on the slide. What is a stakeholder? Yes? Just anyone who's involved in the company. Anybody who's in, affected by the company, related to the company, has an interest in the company. So we can see examples here. External, outside the company. Internal, inside the company. Employees, managers, owners. Internal stakeholders. Very strong interest in the company, right? Outside, suppliers, society. Government, creditors, shareholders, customers, right? If we're an oil company, probably we'll have NGOs. Do you understand NGO? Yes. Because the NGO doesn't want damage to the environment, okay? So if we're, uh, we can also have the local community, right? We have a, a polluting factory. The local community is not happy. They are stakeholders. So, under the neoclassical framework, we're only thinking about one, one stakeholder. Which stakeholder are we thinking about only, according to the neoclassical framework? Owner. Owners, right? According to the neoclassical framework, all we need to think about is the owners, and making the biggest profit for the owners. Okay? The stockholders are the owners. Then, once we make the biggest profit for the owners, then we can help society, right? All the companies do well for themselves, then they help society. But according to the stakeholder idea, not just the owners, but all the stakeholders are involved in <coughs> making the decision. So, in the 60s and 70s, we started off with uh, corporate social responsibility activists. So later we're going to do a class on corporate social responsibility. But corporate means company. C for corporate, company, right? Social means society. Responsibility means check in. Do you understand? <laughs> Are you responsible? Are you responsible people? Yes? Okay. I think great students are quite responsible, right? People, usually in Korea, parents teach their kids to be quite responsible. I don't see any graffiti in Korea. Do you understand graffiti? Yes. I don't see any broken things in Korea. I don't know about Denmark, but in Ireland when people drink a lot, they're not very responsible. They usually break something. So, in Korea you have very nice screen TVs on the metro or in the metro station, yes. but in Ireland some drunk guy is kicking the kick and break the TV in the metro station. So I was very surprised it was at the face level. In Ireland it would be very high so nobody can, nobody can touch it, right? What about in Denmark? Yeah. Same as Ireland or the same as Korea? Uh, they just drink and destroy things after drinking. 
Yes. So, do you think Korean students are quite responsible? Well, I didn't get time to record it uh, mm. in depth. Mm. Okay. So, please don't copy the Irish students, right? <laughs> because I told you that. They're bad, right? Breaking things. So, <coughs> anyway, responsibility. The company shouldn't break things. They should be responsible, right? So, this idea grew in the 60s and 70s. We have, why? Because we have, at this case, we became aware of environmental issues. Poverty. You know, 200, Sweden is one of the richest countries today. But if you looked at Sweden 150 years ago, the difference between Sweden and India, not much, right? Almost the same standard. They lived to the same age. They had the same kind of standard of living. But nowadays, we have big difference between Sweden and India, okay? So this kind of issues like poverty has been growing. Uh, so according to Milton Friedman, Friedman, he's a person who supports the neoclassical theory. There is only one social responsibility of business, to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profit. So long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say, engage in open and free competition without deception or fraud. So he thinks of the neoclassical thing. Just your company, just follow the rules, follow the law, right? And make a profit, and that's all the company has to do. Okay? Then after the company makes a profit, creates jobs, okay? it can help the local economy, okay? help the people, and the company shouldn't worry about anything else. Okay? Just keeping the law, whatever laws are made. So discuss with your partner. What do you think? Do you agree with Milton Friedman, who says this, or not? Okay. So Milton Friedman is saying, the neoclassical idea, business just has to make a profit. Make a profit within the law. Okay? That's the only thing a business has to do. Okay? Because after this, as we explained in the other story, if the business works for themselves, they can produce something valuable, and later they can pay taxes for to pay for education and so on, right? Or they can give money to charity, right? If they want. So discuss this with your partner. Do you agree with him or not? Yes, what do you think? disagree with him. He is saying the company should just make a profit and don't worry about other yeah, things. Okay, so you disagree, you think the company should have a good image? Yes. Why? Okay. Is there anybody 
who thinks that the only thing a business should do is make profit and keep the law. Keep the law. Keep the law and make profit. That's all a business should do and not worry about anything else. Okay? You guys? Right? So, no reason to come to the course. You can go home now. <laughs> so, if you, you can... That's what you think. Then there's no reason to study ethics because ethics is above the law. Right? The law is here and ethics is up over here. Okay? So ethics is, business ethics is saying that the company, we have to go further than the minimum of the law, right? We have law, but ethics is different than law. Okay. So let's take a break now uh, for 10 minutes. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.